you like the most? Yeah, I could try it and decide <coughs> not to include it. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Is this your first parents that they have? Oh, parents that they have. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right. Anytime. Okay. You ready, Mira? Yeah. Okay. All right. So can you start by just letting us know your your name and your age and where you live? Um, well, my birth name is Sue Simons, but I've been asked to call myself Amira as a spiritual name, and I live in Brownsville, Oregon, um, and I'm 50, 58, I'm going to be 59 June the 4th. Right, um, so, so a film about happiness, of course, but um, we'll start maybe by talking about some times in your life that were more challenging or where you were more depressed or more unhappy than you are now. Um, can you talk about a time like that? Well, I think it, from the age I'm at now, there have been many times that have been up and down. Um, I have gone through many trials. I have a younger brother that committed suicide. That was really a hard time for me. I was a young mom. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. So I dealt with <coughs> with him um, dying. I think I think I that's been that's been like thirty some years. So I'm really kind of have dealt with that and I'm used to that. I think one of the things that, um, I, I, I think I'd probably want to focus on something more in the closer because it's probably more relevant to who I am now. Um, and I deal with people in my work that are um, dealing with so many trials all the time. So it feels like I revisit different trials. I feel like I revisit the trials I've had in my life. And so there are various trials. Like I look back at the beginning of my life and I feel that um, in many ways I was really confused as a child. I, and I felt like I had a fairly good parenting and pretty fun childhood, but I felt very confused about what, what, it, what was supposed to happen in life and um, what families were supposed to do. And I, I'm a family therapist now and, and I see this happening with people all the time that, that our families, um, I kind of have my own theory about it now. I feel like our families are so detached from how communities have traditionally been for human beings that um, part of the things we're dealing with, our, our culture is, is reaching a point where um, people aren't surviving, families aren't surviving. I grew up in a time, um, just a minute, I grew up in a time when we talked about the nuclear family and I feel that the nuclear family um, doesn't even exist. I mean I work a lot with um, single parents, a lot with mothers who have fathers, They're, they have children with four different fathers. Um, I think that the what we're doing now is we're starting to build a new way to live and um, that's what fuels me with happiness now. So I'd like to focus on um, probably the thing that, one of the challenges that turned me around was um, I was having some health issues in the late 90s and, and just concerned that I might be dying and then found that I, um, later on I found out that I had sleep apnea. And I found this out after I moved to Hawaii. And um, the, the whole experience of moving to Hawaii was quite life-changing. And um, coming to this grip to realize that I, that I had the power to do what I wanted to do um, really is what changed my life, I think. I've, I think there are many changes throughout my life, but I think that that's one of the ones that's been very paramount. And if I look back now, uh, the changes that happened in Hawaii, I, I, I met a bunch of the intenders. Um, some of the, the people that helped start the Intender groups that are around the world right now and started a t an intention, intention process with them and did that for about a year and then brought it back. And um, I think just the spiritual challenge of living, I lived at a house, um, just a minute, I have my tears are coming down. Um, I lived in, I bought a, a flower farm when I went over there. I had no idea. I went over to see what it looked like. And um, I was challenged, I was at work one night, I was working in a psych hospital, and um, a young lady came in and told me that she had bought a greenhouse. And um, I had remembered a time when a man told me that jealousy actually was something that could be a healthy thing for when we feel jealous, that that's the time you might go for a goal. And I remembered that statement, and this one was talking about the greenhouse, and I was thinking, I became real aware how much I really loved greenhousing, and, plants and shortly thereafter I saw an ad in the paper for a flower farm in Hawaii and um, it was almost as if spirit just said you need to do this so I went over there flew over there probably within a week or two and then I moved over in about two and a half months I made it all I, I did everything I sold everything I owned I wrapped things up with my family I had been a foster parent and my 
a friend of mine stepped up to take care of the little boy that I was taking care of and he later adopted him. Um, my daughter was, my youngest daughter was about 10 then and she stayed with her father for a brief time. And I went over to Hawaii and lived in a house that had no electricity, no water for three months, maybe three and a half months. And then I was joined with some other people who helped create a community there. And um, living alone there from, by myself was quite a challenge. I, re I remember the first night I got into Hilo, I went to Walmart and I was looking for foam pads and couldn't find any. There's no foam on the island. And so I, I bought a, um, a blow-up mattress and I took it home to this, this shack. In Hawaii, the hot places are like shacks. And um, there were no screens on the building, and it was a little teeny tiny building. And um, I, it had a lock on the door, though, so I was happy with it. I had a lock on the door. And I put the, I slept on that blow up thing for the first, I think, day, and I thought, this is miserable. So then I went and went garage sailing and found a mattress and just started filling my house up, not filling it up, but getting a few things I needed. And I lived there. Um, I would ha I had a spiritual practice when I was living there. I, I found a job within three mo within a month. I found a job, um, and then I would do things like walk home and and just walk in the dark, because um, the island of Hawaii is one of the darkest places on earth. They have um, some oh you know the things that you look at this those big giant telescopes on the top of the mountains and. Um, it was so dark. I was. I would walk home. I would. I had a practice for walking from the car to the house. It was a little bit of a walk, and I would just take steps very quietly. And so that sounds kind of silly, but it really helped me get centered. And um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. If I have to stop, I'll just pull. Yeah, this do because because this all be edited in anyway. Um, I I lived there by myself. I think I think the thing for me to go by myself was really the challenge because I I think when I first went to Hawaii, I wondered if I was dying. I felt so sick. Um, I just wasn't well. I wasn't healthy. I didn't have any strength. I was. I w took a trip to Portland, and I would fall asleep two or three times on the way back home. And so I think I realized once I got there that part of me thought I was dying. And I think I acknowledged that to my children later. I've been. I'm a single parent. And I've raised. Um, I have four grown children now, and they're all really flourishing people. And. Um, for for them, for me to just go off to Hawaii, they kind of, I think they were kind of surprised, but they kind of all just accepted it. And um, I was at that time thinking I would, I would was going to be there for my life and um, create this community. Anyway, um, when I was there, I realized that it was really more about me just getting centered and finding myself. And... Um, which is what I proceeded to do. And um, I had some spiritual things happen there that were quite powerful. I met a man um, that when you're in Hawaii and you have no water, you go to the baseball field to get water. You, um, so I drove to the baseball field and I met this, this little man. He was kind of a younger man, about 38 years old. And um, his name was Joseph. And he told me that he was a kahuna, and I, I just thought he was full of bullshit. But um, he ended up coming to my house one day, and we were sitting out in the middle of the daylight, and I was talking to him, just talking, visiting, and all of a sudden his face started to shape shift, and I thought that was just rem I was just stunned. I I didn't know what to to make of that. I was, anyway, I um, looked at his face, and he his face shifted into three or maybe five to seven people and each one of them I recognized on a soul level as being someone um, that I had known that had been a teacher of mine. It was almost as if I was looking at an altar in an Indian place. They were, you know in India how the people put pictures on altars? His face shifted into all these different teachers, much like those teachers that are on Indian altars. And I didn't consciously recognize them, but I in my heart recognized them. And then all of a sudden the faces coalesced into one face and he spoke and he said, um, you're exactly per you're exactly perfectly where you need to be. This is where you need to be. Everything's in perfect order. And I was just stunned. And then he, he went back to talking story. He went back to being this traditional Hawaiian man. Um, he also told me at the time when I met him that if I ever needed anything to call three times his name and he, I, he would come. And I thought that was kind of funny. And so a um, couple days after this happened, I was thinking of him and I, I called Joseph, Joseph, Joseph three times. And within, oh, 15, 20 minutes, there was a phone call. And he pick, I picked up the phone and he says, Susu, I told you this is not a joke. And um, 
so he called. So it was very interesting to meet him. Um, but so moving to Hawaii was quite a quite a change for me. I think it had to do with following my dreams, following who I was as a person, and being clear and honest, and also being alone with myself and um, the challenge of creating something new and trusting, trusting Great Spirit that I would be given what I needed. And when I moved there, I knew that we were to create a community and that people were coming. And then within about three and a half months, um, some people from Eugene showed up. There were two people that showed up out of the blue, um, a man from work that I'd worked with and his wife, and they arrived and they wanted to stay there. And um, so they ended up staying there. We all lived together for about a year, year and a half and um, they're still on that land, and they, they have created the community. Um, and then I came back here, and I've been living in Brownsville um, ever since. And I, I, I think I, the way that I, I tend to think is circular, so when you ask me a question about a trial, like I start with my brother's suicide, and I think it's because I, I see this in, in life, like I work with so many people and I see people present themselves, and there's such a similarity, I tend to be a person who talks in circles. And um, probably that's what I'll do throughout the interview. So I hope it makes sense okay. to you. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so the time going to Hawaii was kind of a transformative time for you, or recently. Well, it, it, it was because of that, and I think also because of some of my returns to Hawaii. Um, I went back to Hawaii, uh, to, to Maui in 2004. I remember as we got off the airplane, um, John Kerry was giving his announcement that he was giving up the election. And um, my friend Bonnie and I went to Maui to visit, a and we met a friend, Roland, there, who took us all around to the sacred swimming spots in Maui. And I started having some, um, some st really strong spiritual things happen there, too. Um, and that's, we went to the Haleakala, and when we were at Haleakala, it was all clouded in. But when I got there, I felt really called to stand there before the um, the volcano, and I took my shirt off and just stood there in prayer for about a long time, oh, maybe an hour, long, long time. And I was told that's when I was reminded again to use my this new name I'd been given. I was gifted that name at summer solstice, the the summer solstice before, and I was asked to change my name from Amanu to Amira. And I was a person who did not ever want to change my name from Sue. So to have these different spiritual names that I was being asked to use was very difficult for me. And I didn't use the name Amanu for a long, long time. And then I started using it, and I used it even professionally with people. And so to hear that I needed to now change my name for the third time was very difficult. And um, going to Haleakala, I knew that I needed to start using that name, um, Amira, and so I've been using it ever since, and I'm n not struggling with that anymore. Um, you're gonna edit these parts out, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, um, there have been, I think, many things that have happened in Hawaii that have been um, really significant of my because of my spiritual practice. Um, I went back to the Big Island, I think it's been now, let me think if it's two or three years. Um, it might be three years ago, two years ago. I went in November and um, went to the Big Island and I was just going on a vacation and um, was staying in a youth hostel and got woken up in the morning um, with a message that said, wake everyone up and tell them to come with you. And so it was six o'clock in the morning and I was all ready to go, you know, to go visit because I used to live in the Big Island. I was going to go see old friends and I made this announcement. I said, whoever wants to go with me to Hilo, get ready in 15 minutes. And all the women who were there, there were three women in the, the, the um, hostel and they all got up to leave and we all went together. And we journeyed um, for the next three or four days on this amazing journey, which um, included amazing earth healing that happened. Um, I didn't think I would talk about this here. Um, we we first went to, um, there were, these women were from all over the planet. One was from Indonesia. One was a woman from Alaska who was moving to Hawaii. And one was a Japanese young woman. And um, the young Japanese woman was this very bless, blissful, sweet woman. Her name was Dabuku, and um, she was coming to Hawaii because she wanted to learn to hula. 
And so she was coming to Hawaii to find her hulao. And um, we all just kind of were traveling together for a couple days. But each of us created opportunities. Each of us was responding to our own spiritual guidance, including one of us would say, let's turn down this road. And so we would go down these different places on that island. And if you've ever been to the island, it's a place where if you allow spirit, you can go there and really learn and get, get told what you need to know for your own um, highest learning. Um, so that, that experience that I had with those women in that island was amazing, including um, we were guided step by step. And one, one of the days we went to the worm pond and ran into different people that I'd run into and known and then encouraged to go visit a doctor who did this. She, we, we had essentially, we were kind of guided to all these steps to cleanse us for this, I believe it was a sacred ceremony that was happening. When we were at the worm ponds, I would stand there and people would walk up from the parking lot. We would feel each other's energy. And someone over there would come to me and they would say, I, I got off the boat today and Great Spirit told me to come here and meet you. And I was blown away. I didn't know what was happening. And I just followed my inner guidance the entire time. And we twirled the energy. We like walked our bodies around and twirled the energy. And then um, this happened with probably four or five, six people, a lot of people. And there was a man the entire time swimming in the middle of the pond, this old man. And um, when I was done twirling the energy with all these people, I, Spirit guided me to go do this with him. And I swam up to him and I said, um, Great Spirit wants me to, to, <laughs> to, to talk with you. And he, he went, I'm in a state of bliss. He wouldn't, don't touch me. So I, I just honored him and we, we swam around each other. And he, he said to me something about the word is like this. He did this, then he swam off. And I was so struck with that. And I didn't, this entire time I was there that trip, I did not know what was gonna happen next. And these three women that were with me, the things that happened, if I did not have witnesses with me, I would have felt like I was having a psychotic break because they were so amazing. Anyway, these women that were with me, um, we all left and we went into this doctor that I'd known and she had some kind of a, new kind of electrical thing that cleansed your body, like it's something you hold the electrodes and you, it's some little new machine that, that helps you. And so what's interesting is that even that happened prior to us going to the, the volcano. And uh, we had wanted to go to the volcano, so we were going to the volcano, and I didn't think of it as being anything significant. We, we went up to the volcano, and when we got there, um, I was really called, it was as if there, there was a big hand, or it was a big energy that was calling me to stop the car. And um, we proceeded, we did some chanting in the car, and I was telling these women as we stopped, the women in the car were wondering why we were stopping, and I kept trying to respond to, I was driving, I kept trying to respond to what was happening to me spiritually. And this one woman who was sitting to my right, her name is Jessie Coulter, and she still lives on the island, I believe, in Kona, and um, she kept saying to me, the couple days before this happened, she kept saying, you know, I know how to drive a car from the passenger side. And she had said this to me probably four times. And in my entire life, I'd never had anybody say that to me. And so as, as she was saying this, um, I had told her finally to, to, that I was not gonna let her ever drive the car. And there's no reason for her to drive the car. And I didn't care if her father taught her to drive the car, that that was not gonna happen. But when we were driving down the chain of craters road, I was guided to tell the women in the car that we were to go only forward with the consciousness of love and love in the car. And um, what I believe that meant is we were to chant love over and over and over. So we chanted love over and over and over. But I, I would say this and these women would all start talking and they would just talk story. They would talk about the ukulele. And I kept stopping the car. Spirit, I allowed spirit to come into me and channel my body and stop, stop, stop the car. And finally, Jessie started getting really angry at me. And I was feeling, well, maybe she's supposed to get out by the side of the car and stand here. Um, what ended up happening was, at one point, I put my hands up in the air because it, I, felt the, I felt this energy that was so important. I felt like this was such an important event. I put my hands up like this. And I went, this is so important. And as I did this, like this, I looked down at my dials on the on the car and they were like this. And I thought, whoa! And Jesse started paying attention and what was happening was there was an earthquake and the earthquake was happening when I was doing this. I don't think I created the earthquake. I believe that I was just in touch with this energy and my hands were stuck to the ceiling of the car. So 
I said to Jesse, all the people in the car started getting really serious at this point. They were chanting. We started to chant love. And um, I asked Jesse to please drive the car. Cause I, and so all this time she'd been saying she knew how to drive the car, she drove the car for me and we were laughing and um, later we kind of joked about this is a Shirley MacLaine moment. <laughs> and, um, but what happened with that earthquake that night was 40 acres fell off into the ocean. And I believe that we are connected to everything that is important to this planet. Each of us has a special mission on the planet to, to fulfill. I think many of the children that are coming here are divinely guided. Um, many of us have had indigo children, um, star children. I started hearing about this in the mid 80s from some people. And um, I'm getting really into this deep spiritual place. I don't know if you intended me to go, but this is really where I find my happiness is by listening to my inner guidance. And that's the reason I came here today was I, when I first saw your note, I wasn't really desiring to be interviewed and I thought, this is um, Great Spirit wanted me to come. Last night when I was checking in with myself, it was, you're supposed to go. I have kind of actually had visions that people would be taping this story, although I didn't think I would be talking about this story. Um, what's happening now on the planet is that we are all co-creating everything that we need and want. We can go forward with um, loving kindness on the planet. And I think that in this, this area of Portland, the Northwest, there, there are certain centers all around the planet that are like communities that are here to create the way we're going to be living. And we're, we're essentially schools of life to teach people how to live. That's why you're manifesting what you want to manifest in your life. And um, so that's my spiritual thing. Um, the way that I stay happy is, I actually, I, I think it's very important to feel all human feelings. It's, I, I'm a mental health therapist and um, I have worked with all kinds of very difficult situations. I worked around situations where people were murdered. I've helped family members heal from having a child murdered. I've um, been around a situation where if a kid had told me who a victim was, I would, a girl would have, her life would have been spared. and. Um, I've, I've worked with people, a lot of sex abuse, a lot of drug and violence, a lot of recovery, a lot of people, a lot of children that are little tiny children that have been harmed from the time they were very small. And um, I work with a lot of really healthy families also, a lot of families that are just wanting to do better and have more fun. So what I've discovered in my own life is if I feel my feelings, if I feel all my feelings, if I feel pain, if I feel sadness, if I feel deep grief, um, then I can feel everything. And if I cut any part of myself off, then I really am accommodating and I'm not really being authentic. So um, to me, my happiness comes from being very present in the now, being very real, whether it means crying or um, getting powerful at a staff meeting when you see something happening in an agency that you think is wrong. I one time worked in an agency that um, the air quality was horrible. I was in middle management and the air quality was just, as soon as I worked there, I, I noticed that it was very unusual the kind of air quality they had there. And this was probably one of my challenges in my life was when I worked at this agency and I was in middle management and I noticed that I, w I, got, I felt sick from being in the building. There was one little window in the whole building, it was a mallet kind of building and the people had been working there for six years. And I started noticing one of the staff people getting quite ill. And um, I went to the management and brought it up and they said it would, it would affect their raises, our raises, if we had to alter the building. And they didn't really believe it. They wanted to believe this person was an alcoholic or she had other problems. And so I was supervising people and watching them get sick and I worked there about a year. And then I started realizing that I could not stand, I could not live in that lie anymore. Um, the man who was my supervisor was a very amazing, healthy man. He always ate or only organic food. He rode his bike to work. And he was also living this lie. And I would go to staff meetings and watch him fall asleep because there was no oxygen in the room. And so I, um, I began to realize I needed to, rep I needed to report this. So um, I became a whistleblower. And 
when they finally did all the testing, when the, the company, the OSHA company did the testing, they discovered that the contractors who built the building had never opened the opening for the air ducts. So the building had been a closed air system for six years for all these people. And um, the CO2 levels were skyrocketing in about five minutes of being in the rooms. And um, out, this is much longer after I, I had left. I had been gone for several months when I found this out. But that was an example that, that we all need to stand up and we all need to speak our truth. And if we don't, then the, the corruption and the illness that is going happening will continue. And that I think that brings me to how, also, how I also stay happy is our language, the language that we choose to use, how we frame things is so important. Our words create our reality. If I wanted to focus on this negative story, I could focus on it for a long, long time and feel worse and worse and worse. And so I need to very much watch my language and, and speak what I want to speak like, talk about the things I desire. What, how do I want to have fun? Um, who are the people I want to attract into my life? What do I want to co-create with the people that are in my life? I really believe that our, our beloved is always before us. Our beloved is just that being right before us. And, um, I'm a person, I think, when I, I got divorced when I was about 30, oh my goodness, 30-some. Let me wipe my... Um, I need a break. Oh. Need a break? Yeah, exactly. Bill was going to ask, do you, do you want a chair or something? Guys, do you need to sit in for a drink? Okay. okay. <clears throat> Back to talk to being happy. And, you know... One of the, the things that I learned in Hawaii from some people, um, the intenders, the intention process is very simple. People would get together and have a potluck every week and they would share their gratitudes and their intentions. And so you'd have a potluck and then you'd sit down and write with a little pencil your gratitudes and intentions and intentions. And then the group would hold you accountable to making positive intentions. So the language, like if you'd say, I want to try, they would say, make it a positive statement. So such that would be um, my body is healing um, with every breath I take. I am living an abundant life and people are flowing into my life that will bring me lots of fun and um, excitement. That's a positive intention. And then the group would, you'd say your intention in the group, you'd ask the group to align with you. And so this whole group of people, um, you'd ask them to align with you and they'd all say, yes, we will. And then you'd, they'd, so be it, so it is. And that process, what was interesting to me, I'd been around, I'd been doing therapy with people for years and I'd been around different group processes, but what I noticed about the intention process is that very different people got together in kind of a spiritual situation and they didn't have conflict. They actually supported each other and nurtured each other. And there was one very shy, odd man that came and I watched his intentions, how he changed and grew through the whole year. This man just flowered. And um, it was really wonderful seeing how that kind of support and loving kindness really helped people. Um, so I came back from Hawaii. I ended up coming back from Hawaii because my I was missing my daughter. My daughter had been there with me. She did not have a good experience there. And I also was given some wisdom by an elder that was there when I told her that I had come to work with at-risk kids in Hawaii. <laughs> and also because Great Spirit wanted me to be there, she had said to me, so... They ain't got no at-risk kids back in Oregon. And so I listened to that and I, I returned because I, I realized that my um, role was really here and I believe I'm, I'm meant to visit Hawaii. I think Hawaii is calling a lot of people right now who are there meant to go. I think if you've ever been in Hawaii in a former lifetime, it's calling you and sometimes it wakes you up when you go there. Um, but talking about um, happiness now, um, I used to have a goal to find a perfect partner. I think when I got divorced, I was really wishing to have a spiritual connection with that person who's my significant other. And um, in the past several years, what I've realized is that I truly believe that my beloved is always that person that's before me. If I can get really clear and just be present with that person, that person is my beloved. And if I can have that kind of presence with anyone, whoever they are, then um, it really fills me up and it fills them up and we both come away feeling pretty good even if there's a time of conflict i've i've had some situations occasionally where um for me to be really real and authentic i had to be very powerful and give a boundary and say no this is not what i want to do right now um i don't feel comfortable with this then or um 
we have to let's think about this I've given myself the permission in my life to um, have my own process with my artwork I was a person I grew up I had I felt like I needed to get married that was what I wanted to do was have children and I had three beautiful children and I moved around for my husband's career and then I started realizing I didn't have that intimate feeling with him an intimate connection and I really wanted to have that connection in my life and actually the intimate connection I was looking for was my connection to spirit um, which I feel like I have now um, what I do now is I have I now feel like at the age of 58, almost 59, what I want to do is I want to have as much fun as I can. I want to just enjoy my life and um, do as many fun things as I can, many fun, exciting, exciting things. I love music, so I do as much as I can around music. I volunteer at the Wow Hall. I last night was sitting backstage. I was backstage security and had to tell Luton Faya that he could not smoke cigarettes in the Wow Hall. And... Um, it was quite funny because then he came on stage and he encouraged the whole crowd to smoke marijuana at the wow hall so it was kind of funny i was i was sitting there with both settings and i realized that i was not going to um rock the boat for this big giant group that was having a big performance and um the wow hall is a wonderful example of how people can live the wow hall was saved it was a building in eugene that was saved by the community because it was going to be torn down and they saved it for a community arts center and the people essentially own that community and I'm a volunteer there and so in the last year year I've been volunteering I've seen many different acts I go whenever I want to for free and I volunteer and it's run by the volunteers so it's a wonderful example of how communities can can create art for the community um, I'm, I'm a person who as a younger person I was in art I I really turned to art because I was so bored with traditional learning I could not survive in a regular college setting and I realized that either I needed to do something that was fun or I was going to fall out of school. So I had a friend that was an art student and I thought I really envied her. So I decided to become an art student and I became a, I became a sculptor. And um, right now what I do is I've been making glass beads, I've been painting, I've been doing some sculptures. And since my kids have grown up and I'm living in my house now by myself, what I realized is I've turned my entire house into a studio. And my process, which is, I've given myself permission to see what my process is. And prior to this, I moved the first probably, oh, 25 years of my adult life. I moved probably 25 times. I moved many, many times. My ex-husband was in the Air Force, and then we moved because of graduate school, and then our children grew up. And we, the longest we lived somewhere was probably Bloomington, Indiana, for about four years. And then moving here, um, it's kind of ridiculous. I, I actually moved about 19 times since I got divorced, but the last seven or eight years I've been in the same place for the first time in my life. And what I've done is I've allowed myself to just realize that the, the arrangements I was making on the shelves actually has a lot to do with the kind of art I like to do the most is assemblage art. And so I started realizing that these little tchotchkes or little things I was putting together in relationship had to do with art that I like to do. So I started like realizing those were potential pieces and I started having all these little groups of little pieces all over the place. Like right now one of the projects I'm working on I just started this week is um, it's kind of a project I don't know where it's going and I'm letting myself not know where things are going and I um, started I was peeling my tangerines and I love the way I would spiral them and then I started stitching them together so now I'm drying I have about four little tangerines drying and um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with those and it's kind of like being excited about what what's happening every day in my life. I'm kind of like a kid, I think. I work, I go to work. I work um, at mental health um, in Albany. I'm a mental health therapist for children and families, and so I'm working pretty hard. I have every other Friday off, which I really appreciate. And I think if I had the money right now, I'd probably want to work half time. But um, the structure, I, I think that what gives me happiness is having structure to my life and having just the freedom to do what I want to do when I want to do it other times. So I keep a very strict um, work ethic with, I get up and go to work and I, I'm really good at doing my paperwork, I'm really good at doing the things that you have to do to make a living. Um, if you want to make your living that way. I think I'm challenged right now because I think, well, maybe I should turn my art into a living, but I wonder if that would change my art. So um, I, did, I did bring this painting behind me because this is something I started. I received these pictures from a person I was my therapist from years ago, Carmelita Thompson, 
And I told her years ago that I wanted to, I saw these pictures of her mother. This is her mother and, um, I'm gonna pull this down. This is, this is her mother. And um, this is a picture that was of her mother at the beach with a dog. And this is a picture of her daughters and she, and they were all kind of at their house. And um, so I had run into her. I was at an art show the other night and ran into Carmelita. And I hadn't seen her for years. So um, I was also cleaning. I was doing something in my house looking for a crochet hook. And I found those pictures, which I hadn't seen. And I thought, ah, I met Carmelita. And the next day I see these pictures. I need to paint this painting. So I sat down yesterday and just started to paint the painting. And part of what happens when you do art is you have to let go of the outcome. And like this does not look, for me, I felt very frustrated. I want their faces to look exactly like what they look like. And what I've been doing is letting myself just create something and not being attached to how it looks. And so um, as I was looking at the painting yesterday, I thought, you know, I was kind of meditating. How I meditate is I kind of get quiet. I go inside. I close my eyes. I might listen to music. I might not. I have a lot of sacred music like Shantala. Um, I love Deva Prima. I like chanting. I also just like the radio sometimes, but sometimes I, I also just be, I'm quiet, but I'll go into private quiet time and just let my mind open up. I open it to God. I open to whatever is there. I open to my own thoughts. I open, I welcome whatever comes. And one of the things that came yesterday about this was that um, this piece could actually become, like if I would paint every week a new painting for 13 weeks, this could become something that could become a story for children, if I wanted it to be that way. And also, it could just be a painting that I give to my friend Carmelita. It could, you know, um, as I look at it, it kind of, it turned into these creatures. I've been having these little blue sperm in a lot of my paintings lately. And um, I think that they're actually about the return of the goddess. Um, Martina Hoffman's an artist who when I saw her work, her work is amazing. A lot of the artists that are working now, you see their paintings and the painting tells you in one painting how to meditate, how to think about God, how to focus, how to get connected to the earth. I believe that we're living in a time when um, we're connecting to the earth and we are connecting to the source of all that is one and we are all connected as one. Um, I, I did the meditations with Annika on the Oneness Project, and that was really wonderful. I think it's it's still going. The man last night, as he was singing with his um, with the crowd, he was singing the song, we are, we are All One. I think that what's happening right now is I think Great Spirit is coming through all the people, through visions, through the creation, through the things they create together, through music, and um, we're waking everyone up. And I believe also the young children that we have that have come. The, the children that um, I first heard they would be called star children, then I heard that they would be called indigos. And I think the latest, the, the latest vibration of those children is the crystal diamond children. Um, they're, they're amazing and I, I recognize them and they recognize me. And I, one of the jobs that I've had in my life that I was gifted with, I was told spiritually, was I was going to be one of the greeters and meters of these children. And each of us need to be aware that these children are coming. These children are very powerful and they have a lot to teach us. Um, my grandson, one of my grandsons is a little boy who's like this and when he was 18 months old I went up to him at a door and he jumped up, did a 360 degree spin and ran off the other way. And this is a remark, that's a remarkable thing for a little boy that age to do. Um, some of these children I think are getting so they don't fit the normal schools that we have for them, so we need to start adjusting our schools. Many of the schools are starting to change. Some of the schools are starting to have special programs. I think actually we probably need to return to a time when we have children stay in our homes. We're essentially putting our children... One of the things I learned when I was in Hawaii, I was driving to the volcano one day, and I noticed all these children, it was 6.15 in the morning, and all these families were putting their, their children out on the road to get picked up by the school bus. And I had this awareness inside of me that these people were putting their treasures out on the road instead of waking up and having a family meal. So I think that we need to return to times when the family is sacred and honored and that the time we spend together is sacred, that the time we spend with our friends and with our families is sacred, that we have meals together, that we share, that we create families. I think that's why I come to Portland because um, this is one of my families and I'm one of the bridging people. 
I have connections in Portland and in Corvallis and Eugene and Brownsville. And it seems like one of the things I'm doing is connecting those people to kind of flow back and forth. Um, so, um, I don't know if I've answered everything that you had oh, as a question. Gosh, you might have. Let's see here. Um, That's going to be interesting for you to edit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess one other thing on here. Well, you did talk about it somewhat. Nature. Spending time nature. in nature. Oh, I'll Just, talk about Brighton Bush. Okay. Um, I have several places in nature. Actually, one of the ways I started waking up was just by right after I got divorced or when I was contemplating getting divorced, I took some trips to the coast. And um, I was a person, I tell this to my clients sometimes, I just told this, this story to somebody. When I used to, to go from my car to my front door, my parents lived in Littleton, Colorado. And I would, it was just a little walk, it wasn't even very far. And I remember leaving my friend's car, getting to the front door and feeling terrified, feeling like absolutely scared, like something was going to grab me. And I thought, this is, this is really ridiculous. I didn't think that then, but it was kind of like a fear was kind of instilled in me. And I didn't even ever think about why it was there. And so when I was um, contemplating getting a divorce, or maybe it was shortly after I got a divorce, I took a trip to the beach all by myself and I would take myself camping alone on the beach. And I would kind of scout the area before dark. And I would see where, where the maybe vacation home was, nobody was staying, or I would go to Yahats where a little beach was that I knew about. And I would um, wait till after dark and then go park my car and camp all by myself. And um, doing this was almost a spiritual practice. I really, being in nature, like listening and, and being there and, and just kind of being with myself in nature was so important. Brighton Bush um, is a connection like that. Brighton Bush is a place where they, there are sacred waters there and people who go there would go there to spend time together, to um, connect, to do sacred practice on summer solstice and the other holidays. I believe everyone's returning to essentially to earth-based religions, to the earth-based. The earth is speaking to us. We're all we're all really people that are living on the earth and when we tune into the earth. Um, I, I was guided, I've been guided to teach some simple things about how to live right now and, and it actually connects everyone to the light bridges. There, there are some light bridges around the planet right now that are they kind of look like a geodesic dome all around the planet that um, I started becoming aware, I, I became aware when I was making love with someone that we were creating this amazing light energy, this, this energy that was going up, up, up. And I started noticing that it was going, um, that it became this other things, that it was beyond our bodies. And um, the time I went to Hawaii and all the, ha the stuff happened with the earthquake, um, I was having these visions of the light bridges and the reason that we were there in Hawaii at that time was we were weaving the bridges to the center internet of the planet. The internet of the planet is like a light bridge inside the planet. And one of the things that happened in Hawaii was when I was driving down from the volcano before the night before, it was the day of the earthquake, I picked up a young man. I was driving and the spirit says, pick him up by the side of the road. There's a young man hitchhiking. I don't normally pick up hitchhikers picked up this young man and spirit said, tell him about, tell him about the bridges. And um, I started to tell him about the light bridges and he looked at me and he said, Amira, I've been drumming the internet into the planet for with 300, 400 other drumming groups over the last year. So this young man that I was asked to pick up, he and I were working on the same event and we were, we were called to be talking to one another. Um, so, and, and then it ended up that he was living with a young woman that I knew from Eugene. But um, many of us are connected and linked to this, and I've been I've been wanting to have um, pictures of this. It's on the internet now. Actually, the grandmothers, the thirteen indigenous grandmothers, even talk about it. They call it the the fissure nets of light inside the planet. But it's a system that we can access and stay aligned with any time by visualizing a waterfall of white light, sending it down through our bodies to the center of the earth, wrap it around, and let it go. And um, that will keep you aligned. When you're in communication with others, if you put your fingers like this, that you will always be very powerful in your conversations and your feet flat on the floor. I've been teaching this, it's interesting. The week I was, I was shown to do this, I was at work, I think, the first time I was really aware to do this. And I went in to talk to a, um, a coworker 
who is a very, um, she's a, I think a Lutheran. She's a kind of a Christian woman who's very kind of strict and she's not a, very into the same things I am on the surface. And I went in to show her these techniques and she said, I've been doing that all week too. So it was very interesting to me that we both were guided to do the same visualization and same relaxation exercise for people. And I think that it's really helpful um, to do those things. And um, I think that when when we tune into ourselves, when we tune into yourself in a meditative way, the other thing I was told was this is for outward communication. This is for inward communication for meditation. When you do this, it's like meditating for two hours, five minutes of this. And it has to do with your ley lines. It has to do with your, your acupressure points in your body and the energy you can send yourself. Um, so I've been using it now for um, probably about three or four years, and it's pretty amazing. And I've taught little children. There's also a technique I teach people that I was gifted with too, to, to show parents how to hold energy with their children. And for these new little ones, I think it's really important. It helps them stay centered. You used to have the parents stand behind their head and hold the hands there, and then you do symmetrical ear pulls. But um, all this came from just having it downloaded. And um, I believe we're living in the time when the more we stay connected to our inner spiritual self, we'll be guided to where we're supposed to be. We need to disconnect from the craziness that's in the world. There's a lot of craziness in the world right now. And um, we're, we can create whatever we want to create. I think it's important for us to remember that. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Do you feel complete? I, I feel pretty complete, yeah. I, I feel pretty complete all the time, though. <laughs> so it's just, it's funny that it's you because I remember meeting you. I didn't realize you were the person who was doing this. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you feel complete? I do, yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot there for you. And, and I, I, I guess I apologize that there's too much, and I, I tend to just kind of need to go with whatever happens when I do it. Yeah, that's totally fine with me. And I was just thinking, I mean, this is going to be a short project, and there's going to be, you know, five people, so very little of this is going to make it in sure. there. But I might be able to, uh, if you ever, like you said, you had some thought of it being videotaped or something, if you, I might be able to get you a copy of this if you would like it for yourself as well. Oh. The, the okay. longer stuff that doesn't make it in, so. Could just give her the stake for now. Yeah. <laughs> After we get the stuff off it. Did it give you enough of what you need for your project? I think so, yeah. There were several times. I mean, I don't, I'll have to watch. I've lately been making glass beads, and I just made some beads that are, like, amazing. I've been making Ganesh beads, and um, they're really turning out nice. You know, this occurs to me, too. I was planning to do, um, I think I mentioned this early on. I don't know if you recall, but I was wanting to get you know, interview footage of everybody and then also maybe some action stuff of you doing things that bring you joy. Uh -huh. So that's, um, that would be great if we can find some time to do that at some point. Another object about that as I get more into it and figure out what I want to include. Yeah. Um, sort of visual that we could do. Like, like if there was any, if, if there was any time when we could visit you and spend some time in nature or something like that. Most of that um, shooting I was thinking would have to be a little bit farther away, but um, Browns was really fun. I've never been there. I don't even. I don't. Oh, think it's a sweet it. town. It's, you know, what's interesting about Brownsville is they just um, were gifted with a fire hall. Like they all went to the the art club. The art club gives. I'll help teach some of the kids that a couple times. Um, but they, the town has. There are a couple people there who used to be Hollywood filmmakers. See, I don't know his last name. He was. He was. Actually, some of the people who are there, one of the, no, these people live over in Walport. They were people who, the Pittsburgh Steel Hour, remember? You wouldn't have known that. It was in the 50s. There was a TV show called the Pittsburgh Steel Hour. And my friend had this Crohn's disease and has an ostomy bag and never thought she would have that. And um, she's living in a house that they just rebuilt. They just built a house. And she and her partner are quite interesting people. They're, they have a very interesting lifestyle. But these, this couple lives at their house that used to be Pittsburgh Steel. I don't think I'm shaking. Pittsburgh Steel people. It was this Pittsburgh Steel act, like I remember watching it as a kid in the 50s. Uh -huh. and it was like dramas. They uh -huh. had drama stuff. After Twilight Zone. Now we're North Eugene. Okay.